president of the Providence Teachers Union. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been school's been in session for a few weeks now. Yeah. How are things are going? What are you hearing from your teachers about the schools, about the school building conditions? Um, well, we we were off to a really good start, um, but the building conditions, you know, some of them are, are not going to change, and um, because some of them are part of the capital improvement project, but. Um, you know, I, I keep saying, and, and the commissioner is in agreement, that reasonable dinginess is not acceptable for anybody. Um, and so we need to do better, and, and Aramark needs to do better at cleaning and, and the day-to-day -day things. Um, I just had something reported to me today that I'm going to address with the superintendent this afternoon. Um, what was that? Uh, it was a, a, a cleanup of uh, blood that wasn't done appropriately. So. Um, you know that needs to be addressed and, and there needs to be a protocol and if if there isn't a protocol they need to put one in place and we need to know what it is because clearly what we think is acceptable um, you know we, we watch bloodborne pathogen video every year and what happened in, in terms of cleaning up that blood that had nothing to do with that video so it, it's you know not using universal precautions is not a you know it's not a, something on the checkoff list it's something that people need to be well aware of. And so are your teachers reporting to you that basically they're asking Aramark for something, whether mm -hmm. it's a cleanup, I guess most of the time it would be a cleanup, mm -hmm. and that they're just not performing it to the, le the standard that they expect? Correct. In, the, in this case and in another case that I've heard this week that, yeah, it's not, it's not up to standard, what we believe is standard. And standard to us is certainly not, you know, like I said, reasonable dinginess. That's not acceptable. Now, um, Commissioner Infante Green is going to take over the school district fairly soon. Mm -hmm. She has said that she, she hasn't said that she would get rid of Aramark, but she says she has the power to do so. She has the power to change or cancel contracts. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see Aramark gone, or are you not at that point yet? I'm, I'm not at that point yet. I, what I would like to see is um, procedures and protocols that are well known. So every teacher should know what's expected every day. So should their floor be swept every day? In my opinion, yes. Should their garbage be taken out every day? In my opinion, yes. In their opinion, yes. And so keeping up and maintaining in every other building in the state, I'm pretty sure that you know floors are swept and garbage is empty on a daily basis. So I don't think that we're asking too much. Um, so I, I think it, we need to know what happens when you go in and clean the restroom. What, what are you using? What materials are you using? How often does that happen? Those kinds of things. And I don't think that those are big asks. You know, and if in 30, 40, 60 days, if those things are not happening, then, then there needs to be a conversation between um, the commissioner and, and the powers that be at Armagh as to what they're going to do to fix it or not. And what about the... We've, there's been talk of <coughs> rodents um, mm -hmm. in the Hopkins report and afterwards. Have you received any reports of rodents from teachers since the school year started? So unfortunately, not not live ones. Um, we've had some, um, you know, some of the rodents get stuck in sticky traps and, and the sticky traps stay. So we need that cleaned up on a more regular basis. Um, so the traps are doing their job, but you, they need to be removed. removed. And there's a mouse on them? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the building conditions themselves, not the cleanliness, but the physical mm -hmm. buildings, um, what have you heard about that? Because there was some infrastructure work done over yep. the summer in a number of buildings. Yep. So they're continuing to work on Hope High School right now. If, if you drive by the scaffolding and there's a lot of work going on. On uh, Nathaniel Green, where I work, they're working on the roof because the, the leaks in the roof impact both the gymnasiums. So there is the infrastructure work that is happening. Um, but again, the, the biggest concern is the day-to-day -day stuff. So while we're working on the infrastructure, I just don't want to get caught in that cyclical process of kicking the can down the road for the small projects, and then they'll become bigger projects. So we, we need to find a way to balance that um, in figuring out how do, how do we manage the big ticket items with the everyday minutia of what they're supposed to do in schools and keep people clean, warm, and dry. Um, the Education Commissioner, uh, Angelica Infante Green, is expected to take control of the school district mm -hmm. um, end of October, yep. beginning of November. <coughs> She's going to install her own superintendent. We do not know who that person is yet. Um, but she has said that she at least has the power to break open a teacher's contract or lay off teachers if she hasn't said she'll do that, but mm -hmm. if she deems that 
necessary. Um, on the first day of school this year, she visited some classrooms, and she's mm -hmm. told this anecdote over and over again that she went to a classroom where the teacher was playing bingo with mm -hmm. the kids, and she was really disappointed mm -hmm. in that. She's like, that's not, you know, that's not teaching. So are you concerned about um, teachers being fired or laid off uh, once the state takes over? No, no. Um, I think that this is going to be a process, and I think that there will be for a whole host of reasons. We've had teachers terminated in the past, um, so there will be teachers who maybe don't get recalled or don't um, live to see next year in terms of employment for the city of Providence, but I don't think that would be a direct result of a takeover. Um, but right now, if a teacher is terminated, there's sort of a, a process through the union mm -hmm. contract, correct? Yes. Or do you think they can file a grievance, you can have an appeal? It's also state law. Um, will will the commissioner? Do you think the commissioner will have a, sort of a swifter path towards terminating teachers than the city currently has because of the union contract? No, I don't think so. I, I think that um, she, like everyone else in the state, has to abide by the state law. Um, you know, and everyone is afforded their due process rights. And so, um, I don't think her process would be swifter. But um, you know, if she finds that there are teachers who are not doing their job and if she has cause, um, then she or whomever she chooses to be superintendent is well within their authority to try to terminate a teacher, absolutely. Um, the mayor has long lamented the teacher's contract. He thinks it's very thick. Mm -hmm. She, again, um, may choose to make changes to it. Um, the school board recommended some changes to the uh, teacher's contract yes. in the recommendations that they sent to the commissioner. One of them was to address the timeline for hiring that eliminates need for internal hiring rounds. There's, mm -hmm. um, my understanding is, I've read the contract references given to internal candidates and there's several rounds mm -hmm. before jobs are posted to external candidates. Yep. Do you think that process needs to change? So um, in the past we had the process which was basically seniority, strictly seniority based. And um, so you'd basically go into a room and raise a number and pick a, a job and that job would be yours based on your seniority. So what we have now is criterion-based hiring, and criterion-based hiring came out of um, a federal mediation. So it was negotiated after a federal mediator said that um, we could no longer use seniority as the sole basis for hiring teachers in Providence. So what we did was um, we met with the district and we collectively came up with criterion-based hiring. So um, the process is, cumbersome in that there are rounds that we go through, interview processes and things like that, but we're the only district in the state that does that. But do you think it hurt, it harms the district <coughs> in the sense that teachers who are either coming out of college or, or grad school or just coming from out of state perhaps that want to be a teacher in Rhode Island, we've heard anecdotally that they say, well, the process to get hired by another town is faster than the process in Providence mm -hmm. because of all these internal hiring rounds. It's harder for them to get externally hired as a teacher in Providence. Doesn't that hurt the district? Um, well, if the district meets their timelines, it shouldn't. They, they can be hired in June. That's the first um, open hiring fair for outside candidates. And we have 100 vacancies, so, um, <laughs> well, almost 100 now. It's it's less than, than it had been in the first week of school. They can bypass those. Once we're at this point, school started and they have vacancies. Anybody can be yeah, hired right now, hired. as long as they obviously, the, you know. The rounds anymore? No, they don't go through the rounds at all. They they interview with the uh, um, principal and, and they're hired. So what do, you think the, what do you think the real problem is here then? Why do you think we have so many vacancies? Um, why aren't teachers want to come work in Providence? I think we have a few um, issues, quite frankly. Um, one of our issues is um, morale, and morale is at an all-time low in the city. And, you know, that, that's hard to come back from. So that could be one of our issues. One, another issue is that a lot of our vacancy areas are in um, what we call hard-to-fill areas. Um, I call them unicorn teachers, teachers who have certifications in um, English language learners and special education or chemistry and you know mathematics so our sciences are maths um, and our L English language learners are uh, second language learners 
certificates and special education certificates, those are all of the areas that we have the greatest need of right now, and those are very difficult to find. Um, one of the issues that we had in conversations with higher ed was that um, they need to have conversations with their incoming um, candidates because they need to graduate with something more than just an elementary certificate. That makes them a lot more marketable in terms of hiring in Providence especially, but in, in the urban ring as well. Um, if you graduate with elementary cert and an uh, English language learner certificate or a special education certificate, the, um, the chances of you getting hired are significantly increased. Um, but if you just have an elementary certificate only, um, we have a lot of elementary teachers with just that certificate right now. And we have a, a lot of our elementary teachers right now are going to get their English language learner certificate so that they can make themselves internally more marketable within the district. If you were the education commissioner in, in the position of, <laughs> of Commissioner Ponte Green, what changes would you make to, to solve the problems in the province world? Um, I think there are a lot of changes that could be made to solve the, the problems in Providence schools. I think that, um, you know, the budgetary process is a, is a, is a huge process and, and the procurement process is a cumbersome process. Um, but I also think that in order to have what they have, you know, and everybody compares us to Massachusetts. So in order to have what Massachusetts has, we need to have stability. So in, this is my 26th year of teaching. In 26 years, um, I've had probably, I think I've counted almost 11 and a half, I'm at 11 and a half superintendents in 26 years. So that's below the national average for the time that people spend in, uh, superintendents spend in a district. Um, we're about uh, to have another one. We're about to have another one. Um, I can't tell you how many principals I've had. Mm -hmm. But more importantly than that, I can't even enumerate the, the amount of curricula that I've had that's changed. So what, what Massachusetts did was design a strategic plan and then stick with it. So they identified standards that they wanted to address and then everyone was trained in those standards, not just a one-off training but an ongoing professional development cadre where they went through um, over and over again, year after year, and they stayed with, they stayed the course, and they never veered from the course. Um, you know, every time, and not casting aspersions on any any um, administration that we've had, but every time a new administration comes in, they kind of want to put their stamp on things. And so, um, for now, right now, this is the first time prior to this uh, John Hopkins report that we had had a five-year strategic plan with a, a fully vetted vision. Um, that were included teachers and in, and in, um, in the community and so I'm you know I'm nervous about the new superintendent coming in and and then throwing that all away as well so I'm hoping that we can take pieces of everything and then just get a plan together that will be for more than two and a half to three years what's your biggest concern um, and again we don't know who the new <coughs> superintendent is yet yeah. Um, but when the state takeover happens and this new superintendent comes in, what's your biggest concern? What's what's the thing that you would? I know you want to work with the superintendent, mm -hmm. but what what would you fight back against? What's your biggest concern? I, I don't, I don't think I would fight initially to begin with about anything. I think that I would really like to whomever he or she is to walk around the district with them and um, no cameras and you know no. No press and no offense, um, no, taken. <laughs> um, but just to so they can get a look at and a feel for what our teachers are doing, what our kids are doing, and then have conversations um, with our coaches and, and other staff, support staff, so that they can get an idea of what we have as a plan currently. And if they tell us that it doesn't work, or he or she tells us that it doesn't work, then that's fine. But I, I want them to at least see it first before they just take what they've read in, you know, a, a document that happened in four days, as opposed to what we have going on every single day. You mentioned the procurement process earlier. Mm -hmm. um, anything over five thousand mm -hmm. dollars has to be uh, approved by the city council. Um, there was just this 
big book purchase mm-hmm. that the superintendent, uh, Fran Gallo, made $187,000 mm-hmm. for this inspirational book that, you know, once teachers and students started opening it up and reading it, realized it had religious references mm-hmm. in it. Um, first of all, what do you make of, of that situation? And then does that show that purchases need to have more oversight? I know people say that procurement is cumbersome, yep. and the commissioner has said that she thinks it's ridiculous, mm-hmm. the $5,000 limit, but then we have this large purchase being made that turned out to be problematic. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's a sticky situation because um, the in, there was no malintent, right, with the sure. purchase of the book. The, the book was intended to, um, in our conversations, the, the superintendent and I, our conversations was to bring inspiration to our kids and through the vehicle of basketball, which we thought would they would be relatable to, um, especially at the middle and high school levels. And so, and with stars, you know, not with just anybody, just stars, people that they could recognize their names easily. And so, um, when I first heard about someone saying, uh, you know, they had a, an issue with um, references to God and scripture, and I, I I said, okay, I'll take a look at it, and then I went on vacation, and then I came so back and... you hadn't and read the book? <coughs> I had not. And then you got word from, was it a teacher or a parent? One teacher. A teacher. One, one teacher. Then you went on um, vacation. Yep. But I, I had agreed with the superintendent prior to that. She said, we're going to do a book, and I said, okay, it sounds great. She told me it was inspirational. Everything she said, I said, sounds wonderful. Let, let's do it. And so we penned a letter together saying, that was, you know, starting the first of the school year, blah, blah, blah. And so when I got back from vacation, I had a couple of other people sending me texts saying that, um, did you read the book? Did you read the book? And I said, I haven't read the book. And so some people were concerned. And I said, well, you should voice your concerns because she's really open to it. Um, I, you know, uh, as, a, as an English teacher or a teacher of, of literature, you don't always have to teach every word in the book for a book to be powerful or for something to be meaningful. So, um, you know, I I was kind of weighing it off of the amount of phone calls I got versus the amount of teachers there were and students, and I didn't hear anything from parents or anything. So, um, plus I know that, you know, we talk about religion through history class and, you know, ethics classes and things like that, so I wasn't concerned about the the overtones. There's a difference between, like, you know, reading about the history of religion (coughs) and sort of everyone reading an inspirational book together mm. that was is more of a, I don't want to say a, a directive, but it was me- meant to inspire the kids yeah. and it had It was meant to inspire. In it. it had yeah. religion in it, but it wasn't telling kids to be religious in that way. It was about their personal, you know, the individual's personal religious aha moment, if you will. And so, um, but by the time I had decided to talk to the superintendent, um, she had already had conversations with people and decided to pull back on the book. And then other people had said, no, we, we, we want to do the book. So there was this kind of like back and forth kerfuffle about it. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, it is $187,000, and that is a, a good chunk of money. <clears throat> I don't know where that money, I don't know if it was from local funds or it was from a, a particular budget item or line item in the budget, where that money came from. Um, but some people are using it. I do know that the author has been to a school or two, and um, you know she apologized when she when she took it back, and she said she you know she had no malintent and she was trying to you know dare greatly, and it didn't work. <laughs> Should there be more oversight uh, in these types of purchases? Um, approving the, the dollar amounts? Maybe not necessarily oversight in approving the dollar amounts, but maybe a process by which more people vet the, what's being purchased. So, I mean, you know, oversight for a pallet of paper, no, right. ridiculous. Like a lot of people knew about the book, but hadn't read the book. Right, right. So, and I think that was what the problem the was. was. Yeah. Correct. And so, and, and I think that's, that was the issue. So if, you know, for a pallet of paper or for ceiling tiles for a school or for shades for a school to jump through seven layers of hoops and wait three months, it, that procurement process is cumbersome. Um, but if, if it's a book or a curricular purchase that could be cutting edge or could, you know, raise some eyebrows, then there should be a process, yeah. Not necessarily the, 
seven layers of minutiae that have to go through, but maybe a, a panel that you can bring it to, to to review it or whatever the case may be. Uh, the final thing I want to ask you about is the teacher absenteeism. We mm -hmm. um, did a story about this last month, um, about the number of teachers who are chronically absent mm -hmm. in the Providence public schools. It was a lot, um, and we spoke about it at the time, and you pointed out there's very legitimate reasons mm -hmm. for being absent, um, but it's a lot of teachers mm -hmm. um, being chronically absent, which means they're out for 10% of the year, 18 days. How do you, how do you fix that problem? So, um, well, one, we have to work on the way that it was reported to ride, because the way it was reported to ride wasn't like any other district w reported it to ride. So we, add, we did add, the district did add, Providence added um, professional development and things in their, in their data, which is, you know, if you're on professional development day, you're not absent, you're absent why from a classroom. Why are there so many professional de de development days happening during class time hours? So that, it could be, depending upon the curriculum, it could be like um, New England Base Camp and Summit, they do a lot of um, embedded professional development. So that happens during the school day while you're with kids, mm -hmm. so you can actually see the interaction with kids in the product, uh, teacher and the kid, um, like we had those kinds of things. We had a teacher reach out to us, she said, well, I was absent 17 days last year, but it was all professional development mm -hmm. and district meetings. But I guess my question is, those kids still didn't have their teacher yep. for 10% of the year, nearly 10% right. of the year. Is there a way to, to make sure that those professional development and district meetings, which are important, are happening outside of class time more often than during so that teachers can be in their classrooms? So I think it's uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that some of it has to happen in an embedded way because that's how we learn. And so that's in an organic, authentic what, fashion. So rather than set up a, an artificial situation after school, this is happening with the kids and teachers and you can watch the teaching and you can, you know, we take notes on teachers teaching and we talk about how many questions they ask, what type of questions. That, that's valuable data to give to the teachers and the school in terms of what their problem of practice may be if we're doing rounds and things like that. So um, to the degree of 17 days, that is a lot. Um, but there are days where that information that's gleaned from that professional development and, and the data that's gleaned from those instruction rounds is extremely valuable in terms of redesigning instruction and targeting instruction for our, our, our kids. If it's not those embedded type of mm -hmm. professional development sessions, should they, should they mostly be taking place when kids are not in school? Yeah, after school, after school. Um, and we have a whole month, it, it's more than a month actually, but uh, at least a month dedicated to professional development in the summer. So it's the, like the last two weeks of July and the first two weeks of August. President of the Providence Teachers Union, Mary Beth Thank you so much. Thank you.